Hello everyone, my name is Voya and welcome to my deep guide. Today we're taking an in-depth look into the Pocketbook's flagship e-reader device, Inkpad X. So let's dive in. So here is the device. Overall, the design, I think it looks really modern and really sleek. You have this black uh, outline around the screen. The screen is not flush, it is indented. And we have at the bottom, we have the four buttons, the menu, back, forward and power button. And then we have this little edge on the end of it where you actually hold your device. On the sides, I believe that these are uh, maybe just slots for a holder or a mount dock or something like that But they are not speakers as I initially thought because the device does not have speakers Which is kind of odd on the other side. We don't have anything on the top We don't have anything and on the bottom we have the notifications LED which is pulsating in a lovely white light and the USB-C. The back has the Pocketbook logo and it is this uh, kind of ribbed rubberized plastic type of feel which first of all serves purpose that it's not slippery at all second of all it's extremely comfortable to use and it gives a very very high quality tactile feedback as far as the build quality goes it looks really really good sturdy and very nicely built everything is plastic that's my only gripe with it um, for the price range it does make sense that this at least would have been outlined as a metal it's good quality plastic but it still is just plastic everything is nice and precisely made which is something that you would expect at this price range and of a premium model i am not a fan of the sharp edges here I don't understand why that was done in such a way. It's definitely something that you feel in an uncomfortable way. It's digging into your palms all the time. Now, luckily the device is very, very light, so it's not a huge problem, but it's completely unnecessary. I really don't understand why that decision was made because at the very first testing you would see that this is uncomfortable. This is digging into my palms. And we're talking about a reader, so you're supposed to hold it in your palms for an extended period of time. And I don't understand why this would be a thing. As far as the specifications go, well, obviously this is a 10.3 inch e-ink carta capacitive display, but it doesn't have the Wacom uh, capability. So you can't really use a Wacom compatible stylus. It's only capacitive. So that means only touch or capacitive compatible pens will work with it for scribbling. Uh, standard display of 1872 by 1404, which means 227 pixels per inch. Uh, it does have a front light and it's their dedicated smart light which is quite quite pleasant and really really works good it's powered by a dual core 1 gigahertz cpu and 1 gigabyte of ram and has total of 32 gigabytes of storage non-expandable uh, the operating system they don't really define they just say linux 3.10.65 so that is what it is. Uh, it has a USB type C, uh, no OTG functionality, Wi Fi only 2.4 gigahertz, Bluetooth 4.0, not 4.1, which is kind of like weird. It's powered by a 2000 milliamp battery, has a G sensor, which means that you can have auto rotation on. It has a cover sensor, it can detect when you have a cover, but since there are no covers available for this thing, then I can't really test it and it supports tons of book formats you can see them all here listed it supports uh, jpegs bmps png and tiff image formats which is pr pretty much the most out of any other competitor and it supports audio formats as in mp3 and ogg only via micro usb adapter that i showed the usb to 3.5 inch or bluetooth as it does not have speakers Audiobook formats, it supports M4A, M4B, OGG, and MP3s, both DRM and normal MP3s. And it also functions for the PDFs. It supports DRM PDFs and EPUB DRMs. And it weighs in at 300 grams, which makes it really, really light, especially for the size. 
So there's two things to cover about the front light functionality of the screen. First is the front light itself. At maximum, it doesn't glow completely crazy like other devices. Instead, it has this, I think, the most uniform lighting that I've seen of any front light device. There's no edges bleeding or anything like that. All of the other devices you see like very very uh, strong light on the corners and then it kind of dims away towards the middle. Not so on the Inkpad X and I think that's one of the strongest points of the device. And the smart light is not really that smart because it doesn't have any sensors or anything like that. All it does is actually it reads the time of day of the internal clock and then depending on that time, he is actually swinging the value of the uh, lighting. So this is something that's customizable and you can actually customize it per hour basis if you really wanted to. Uh So let's explore the main user interface. This is the main screen that you will be greeted with. And on top you have a collection of three times three uh, latest documents that you were going through. So if you slide around, you will see that you will get collection of three by three and you can tap on any one of them and they will just simply open. On the bottom, you have a slideable or scrollable a list of basically your history with dates. When was what added and when did you actually start reading which book, etc, etc. Which is kind of nice to actually see. Uh, I think it's using an A2 mode or something like this uh, to actually be able to scroll because it degrades the image and then it renders it out in a nice way. And you'll see this kind of method of degrading the image to gain speed and then re-rendering again all throughout the whole device. So that's your main user interface and there are basically three areas to always keep in mind. The central area here you have the two arrows on the top that's your notifications bar which you can slide down so that you can get your notifications or you can simply tap on it and it will also appear. We have the shortcut to enable disable Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, front light, front light control as I've already shown it. Then you have the sync, forcing the sync with the pocketbook cloud account and all of that kind of things. And you also have the task manager which is kind of cool because it is able to multitask in a way. So it is remembering what's been loaded and doing all these sorts of things. Multitask is a really useful feature and thankfully there is a short shortcut to it, you don't always have to go here and there, you can simply press and hold the home button as a shortcut and after a couple of seconds the task manager will appear and you will be able to use it. On the bottom we have the shortcuts for three most important apps, so to speak, the library, store and settings and at the bottom we have another two lines which is an indication of an added menu and if we swipe that up then we have all of the apps that are available on the Inkpad X. And that's basically it, that's your navigation. And since this is primarily a reader device, uh, obviously the main focus is going to be on the library and on the reader experience itself. So let's start with the library. The library is the place where you organize and sort all of your documents, books and everything. And there are many different ways to actually organize this and sort it through. If you tap on all books, that's your first filter and you can uh, sort by all books, authors, genres, collections, favorites, folders, formats, series, pocketbook, cloud. Um, so let's say if I wanted to go into collections, then I would see, hey, I don't have any collections. But if I did make a collection, let's say I make a collection here. Here, and I say that this is my new collection, let's call it user manuals. Here while we're typing you will notice one of the um, let's say light motifs of the Inkpad X. It's, uh, it's quite a leisurely device so to speak. It takes its time about everything. Even though it has dual core 1 gigahertz, which is uh, twice the power of Remarkable or uh, Super Note devices, um, it doesn't really show it off. So uh, the keyboard experience is really bad. Um, it's not just the display lag, it's actually the device is displaying. So typing is hit and miss and you really have to just let the device take its time. So man you okay 
Alright, so I added my collection here. And if I go back to home, and let's say that I go back to uh, formats, and maybe I wanted to sort, and I want to go to formats, and let's say that I want to see all of the PDF titles that I have. So now I have them sorted by title, and I can sort uh, also by edition date or opening date or author. So the display itself can be arranged in different ways and there's three different types of uh, views. You have the grid view which is basically just the cover, uh, then you have the list view, cover and a little bit of the details about your reading progress and all that kind of stuff and then you have a large cover and a little bit of here. So here's the thing, initially it's not really easy to find out uh, how to multi-select these things, but there is a way, or it seems like there is a way. You have to long press and hold, and then go select. And now I am in a multi-select mode, and now I can actually press on each one that I want to select, and I can select a few of them. Okay. And the scrolling is uh, weird. You can see how it's going up and down, up and down, up and down. I don't know why he's doing that. It just makes it a little bit more difficult to kind of handle. And the refresh rate is... Uh, but yeah, you, you always can use the arrows down and up to actually just slide the, uh, the pages up and down. Uh, I believe that you should be able to, yeah, you can use the uh, arrows, the buttons down there, and that's actually the fastest way of handling. And you'll notice that while it, that's a general theme as well, while the device does handle all, all sorts of gestures, if there is a way for you to actually do it via the buttons, you will have a much better experience overall. Once I've selected all of the stuff that I wanted to, now I can choose an action. And now I can choose multiple files and add multiple files to my user manuals collection. And they were added, so now that's done. And now if I go back into sorting my stuff, I can go to collections. And if I go into my newly made collection, now I can sort through all the stuff in a nicer way. Similarly, you can create folders and you can do all sorts of things. It's nice to have two filters to search through your data, especially once you have a lot of uh, books. I just wish that the user experience approach was a little bit more intuitive, um, but it does work. Actually, once you do learn how it works, it, it, it does work. So it is something that's usable, just not terribly intuitive. So that's how the library functions. It's, it's a little bit awkward, but it does its job. Next we have the store. And the store, it requires you to have your uh, Pocketbook or Bookland account. So you have to log in and you can adjust the filters for searching the store via categories or language. However, at the moment there are no categories. There's no categories that you can choose from, but there are several languages that you can choose from to actually use. Once you want to choose more, then you click on more. And here we have a bit of an issue. If this is your main store where you're supposed to get your uh, data from, and this is the platform, I mean, this, the, the device asks you immediately to log in with Bookland and all that kind of stuff, but I got four titles in total available in English. Let's see if we have more on some other language. Let's try German. Got two titles in German. We got, let's try Russian. We got three titles in Russian. Okay, technically speaking, yes, there is a store, but the choice is close to non-existent, so I really don't understand what the point of this is. Uh, 
crickets in the store aside, let's start examining how does this thing actually work as a reader. And it supports all of these different formats. I'm going to be testing it on an EPUB and a PDF format uh, because those are most popular. So let's open up the uh, PDF. Let's first cover the gestures and what you can actually do, how to navigate around the uh, documents. First of all, if you want to use gestures, these are the areas that you can use. Top left corner will close the document, top right corner will be a bookmark. The middle portions, both left and right, are moving the page forward, and the bottom corners, both left and right, move the page backwards, and the middle portion here is the menu. You also have the ability to swipe left, swipe right, pinch to zoom in or out for scaling, um, and that's pretty much it as far as the gestures go. So how does that work in reality? Well, it's quite okay once you know what you're doing. The thing that I find really confusing is that if I tap both left or right here in the middle it will move me forward and only if I move here, uh, if I tap here it will move me backwards. I honestly don't understand why that would be a thing. Maybe that's one of the standards that people are used to, but it certainly would have been nice to actually have an option to see, hey, maybe I want it to be left, right, left, right, because I kept continually getting confused, like, wait a minute, where am I in the book? You know, this character doesn't make any sense, and it's simply because I was flipping forward instead of backwards, and it was just a mess. So it took a long time to try and get used to it, and I'm still not used to it. I can't get used to this. It doesn't make any sense. So I stopped using those gestures, and I'm actually using the buttons down here. So you have the buttons page forward and page back, and that works properly. And then the reading experience becomes very, very uh, enjoyable. Alternatively, the swiping works very nice. Um, the device is able to actually detect your gestures in a very good way. And it doesn't matter if it's uh, direct sunlight or not, it actually detects uh, the gestures quite nicely. It's also possible, as I mentioned, you can pinch in and zoom. Um, but uh, plan on having some uh, time for that. It's quite useful and it works really good, but he's still processing, for example. I'm not, and we're done. So that was pinch in, Was it took that much time. So if I now move, so double press uh, will and slide will actually allow you to slide the image around. So if I have two presses and I start moving them around, it will move around and I can now zoom further in or zoom out. But yeah, now this happened. I honestly never saw this before. I don't know how. Whoa, okay, so now he's selecting things. I don't want to select anything. Yeah, um, so now I can pinch and zoom out so that we can get back to normal, maybe, and he's still doing stuff. The gesture works, but the device is absolutely not able to cope with it. So I would not, in reality, that's not something that I would be using. Performance-wise, it's just terrible. One other thing that you also have as gestures is the ability to adjust your front light and the uh, smart light color. By swiping down up and down on the left side, you will adjust the color of the light. And by swiping the up and down on the right side, you will adjust the intensity of the front light. And in theory, that again works fine and it's able to detect my gestures nicely. Let's switch it on and now I can just, yeah. So the performance is quite, quite bad. I mean, it does work and it will adjust the light after a while. So if you keep your finger pressed, in, it will adjust it. But the slider surface is not... I don't understand how long is it. Is it the entire surface of the screen? Uh, where's the maximum? Where's the minimum? And I can never actually get from maximum to the minimum in one slide. You always have to do it multiple times, which wouldn't have been a problem if the device was more responsive, but it's not. So the combination of having to slide up and down many times, 
maybe it works but it, it's a little painful to be honest it, it doesn't lend itself to be like a very comfortable and nice type of experience as an idea and as an approach it certainly makes sense and I can see it as a really nice thing if it were um, calibrated a little bit better and if the responsiveness was a little bit better as it is now it really needs some work that's the navigation done. Uh, in order to get into the menu, you simply need to tap once in the middle and wait, and then you will have your top menu bar and a bottom menu bar. The top menu bar will allow you to close the menu, go to the table of contents, get additional options regarding the uh, document itself, so you can get uh, document details and the status, where it's located, and all that kind of stuff. Um, then you can search in the document and you can add a bookmark currently where you're at. Since we're here, let's get into the table of contents so that you can see how it works. It actually works quite nice. You can slide up and down if you wanted to, or you can use the uh, page down, page up uh, icons, or again, you can use the buttons, which is by far the best option to actually navigate around uh, any of the options on the Inkpad X. Formatting of the table of contents is really good and you have the option of tapping expand all to actually see the entire thing or collapse all. And it's a nice way to actually see the sub chapters and to organize things in a nice manner. Similarly, you have the option of sorting through bookmarks in the document. And by default, when you create a new bookmark, it will be called just bookmark, um, no matter where it is. So no mention of a chapter or anything like that. But thankfully, you can simply long press on any of them and you can open it, rename it or delete it. Um, you don't have to, you can also so simply tap on the bookmark and it will get you to where you want to go. In the table of contents, you also have the option of searching through the notes or annotations that were added in the document. And more on that a little bit later. I haven't added any yet here because we're going to cover that in a moment. Now let's talk about the formatting of the document. With the PDF, um, you have a couple of modes. We have the mode you have the margins cropping and you have the display or the full screen display options. So for the PDFs, we have the zooming ability, which is basically like your pinch uh, zoom kind of function. And then you have four presets. We have fit width, which will work okay. It will kind of stretch out the document to match the width and then your page next and back will actually go until you reach the end of the page and then it will flip you to the next page which is very nice and welcome to actually have it in a reader. Then you have fit page and this will fit as much as it can uh, of the page without cutting anything out. Then we have a column view and yeah, it's processing, so there we go. Um, so you can choose between two column or three column. If I press it again, then it's gonna switch to, yeah, it, actually I did press it, so it's now switching to three column view. So the idea behind it is if you have a document that's been formatted in two or three columns, this would make sense because then you would switch to this and then page next would simply move you down the column. And this is column one, and then once it's done, then it goes to column two column three, etc., etc. Not the fastest option, but it works kind of correct correctly. But unfortunately, there's no way to customize the width of columns or anything like that. It is just the way it is. Two or three columns and that's it. And then you have the reflow option, which will simply reflow the document and rearrange everything how it sees fit. And what you can do is you can arrange in the reflow options, you can change the size of the fonts so that you reflow the document depending on how big your fonts you want them to be. And this is actually surprisingly responsive and it works pretty much okay. It really depends on the type of document that you have, but I found it quite useful on some of the smaller print documents Then it actually made a lot of sense to use the reflow and it works pretty good. Then we have the margins option and margins, you can either turn them off 
which will just leave the default margins, which are quite comfortable to read. It leaves enough room off the edges to make it very, very nice. Or you can have it automatic, which will basically fit it as much as it can. So it will fit it all the way to the sides, all the way to the edges and corners. And it works good because there's no cutting off or anything like that. So if that's your preference, then it works. For me, it's a little bit too close and I find the black edges a little bit distracting. If it were white, then I think it would be less of a contrast and less of a distraction as it is now. It's a bit of a too tight of a fit. And then finally you have the manual option where you can adjust your margins and then it will scale according to those margins. And finally we have the full screen option. You can have the page numbers on the bottom. So currently there are no page numbers at all, but I can turn them on. Ugh. I can turn them on then it needs to reprocess and all that kind of stuff and you can also turn the status bar on to see the connection date and time and all that sorts of stuff and that's the formatting options for the pdfs now let's get into an epub document the functioning is exactly the same same options same table of contents everything else is pretty much exactly the same the only thing that's quite a bit different is of course the formatting um, so the formatting goes is in the settings menu and we can switch between the uh, line spacing so large medium and small at times it's fast at times it's slow i really don't know but the thing is that the screen is really readable and even at the highest density it's actually quite nice and pleasant to read it gives a very very authentic feel of reading a book and that's something that i really really like you also have the margin controls so you can have it very close to the edges medium or let's get going come on there we go and then you can switch to the yeah so you can actually detach it from the edges and have it as a nice package i find reading books on the pocketbook the most pleasant experience um, the user manuals and all that kind of stuff pdfs they work and they're good but obviously the formatting and the the contrast and everything else has been completely kind of tailored for a book reader device which this is and it makes perfect sense and it's quite quite nice combined with the uniform front light under any conditions it's really really pleasant to actually read on this device as far as formatting options we have then fonts and then we can change between several different fonts but i am not going to do that simply because it's extremely difficult to navigate and go over these things because the navigation is really really slow but no matter what you let's now just flip to one of them and then it automatically reflows you can make them italic you can make the whole thing bold but i like the default one the default one is really really nice and then finally we have the display options and we can again uh, choose to display our own pages or built-in page numbering and the stat status bar as well and hypernations can be turned on or off in the page menu finally in the page menu as well you have the slider for the overall font size and you can make it really really large like super huge as in 40 points which is just like my goodness and super tiny let's go down to six and then it actually will form into several paragraphs, which is quite interesting to see. At font sizes 6 and 7, it will flip to two paragraphs, so that you can have, I guess, better readability, that it's not just a wall of text. And from 8-point uh, uh, font size onwards, it will be a single-page paragraph uh, type of uh, formatting. Uh, next in the bottom line we have the option to rotate the document and then you can rotate it any way you want however i have auto rotate on and it will use the gyro so uh, it will take a little bit of time to reorient itself but the gyro actually works so if i now turn it around and it registers okay i'm gonna wait until there we go 
and then it actually fits nicely. So that's the thing that works both on EPUBs, PDFs or images or anything like that. And I like it as an option. However, if you don't want auto rotation, uh, this is where you can actually turn it off and then you can turn it off, align your document or align the device the way you want, find the rotation that fits and press it, wait, and then it will uh, flip itself in that way. There's no uh, dual page option that I found which is kind of a shame because it lends itself perfectly for the landscape format of a 10.3 inch device. However, that's not an option. That's not something that we have. Um, so unfortunately, maybe an update would bring that if there were some updates. Alright, so a long press on the word will get you in the word select mode and that's where we can do different types of things. And there's different ways of selecting words. So, for example, if I long press on a single word after a while, it will give me these selection ends that I can drag around to create a multiple selection. But with the selected word, I can make it a highlight. If I press this button, I can start and get into the scribble mode, which is this button here, the pen. And when I get into the pen, then I can scribble. Um, I can add a note. Uh, which is basically turning the selection into an annotation, which is then searchable in the table of contents. I can do a search in Google because it will uh, automatically launch the web browser because this thing has a web browser and it can go there. And I can look at the dictionary as well. Let's see how you can modify the selection. And the performance is not great. So uh, you can actually drag and it, uh, it will work but I found that the best way to actually get the selection that you want is to kind of end the selection. Uh, let's try here, where is the end of the sentence here? So instead of ending it down here, ending it in the middle of the characters of the sentence that you want will actually ensure that the device understands this better. Otherwise, if I put it in between the lines, it gets often confused and it doesn't know which line is it going. So it's best to kind of keep that marker in the line itself, if you know what I mean. Once I have the selection, I can turn this into a highlight by pressing that button and now it's a highlight. This is where things get to be a little bit um, tricky. With the highlight itself, uh, the pre single press doesn't do much because it will simply flip a page forward in this case. Um, so you have to do a long press again and it will then select what was selected. So then you can delete the selection or modify it or do certain other things. So let's say that I wanted to add a note to this selection and I'll say this is my comment and again let's the HIS is my comment and if I try this then it doesn't work. There's no way of just typing and then letting the device catch up. It doesn't really work. You have to wait. So this has to be this is my comment. Yeah, there we go. That That's okay. So now I've added a comment and I can save it and you will get a tiny little icon here, a little triangle and a big icon here that says that's a comment. And if I go into the main menu now and go into the table of contents and I do my search on notes, there we go. Now I have my newest one is here and if I expand it, it will also say what the comment is. If you long press, you get to the contextual menu and you can rename the whole thing and uh, open it up and delete it and edit text from the table of contents menu, which is nice. Now, in order to change the highlight selection or the annotation, it's a bit of a process. So first of all, you have to long press and select, then it automatically selects it. Then you need to change your selection down to where you want it to be, let's say here. And once that's done, now I have to press on highlight again. And what that's gonna do effectively is delete my old highlight uh, and the note with it and create a new highlight here. So your annotation is gonna be gone and what effectively it's doing is it's deleting the old selection and creating a new one, if that's something that you want. Now, it's very confusing how to delete things. So I've accidentally now added another one on top of the same selection 
and I, I'm not sure what to actually do and I, I don't think that these things should be that difficult. Furthermore, you're actually allowed to just put uh, selection upon selection upon selection on top of existing things, um, basically allowing you to create an incredible mess. So for example, I could press this one here and if I go into the scribble mode, it will automatically put in a new uh, highlight and now I have two highlights even though I'm in a scribble mode but it added a highlight in here and this is now turning into a complete mess of an experience. Um, I, can, I can erase things so I can turn the eraser mode and maybe delete this but it doesn't work with the highlight selection. So getting rid of the highlighted selection the only way that I can actually find it is to go into the table of contents find my notes and then just have a good overview of what is going on here so you have the highlight which I'm gonna delete and this one as well Ugh. And this is, again, a theme with this device. Uh, everything takes a long time, and because it takes such a long time, it's really easy to miss, uh, misclick or misstep or something like that, and it always brings you back to the beginning. It kind of feels like uh, working in DOS in some ways. But anyway, once I actually clear all this out, come on. There we go. And I go back, now it's finally clean again. Um, for me, this doesn't work. This really, really doesn't work, simply because uh, marking things should be a very easy and natural flowing type of action. This doesn't just uh, uh, distract me from my train of thought, it derails it completely from any thought that I had. Because think about this, the whole point of adding annotations and highlighting and marking it is you're reading through a text, you get an idea, you want an added comment, so you want to do this. And for me personally, this workflow really doesn't work like properly doesn't work at all. Uh, there is a bit of an easier way of adding notes and highlighting and that would be to go into the dedicated note option. Once you get into the dedicated note option, it all looks the same, but it behaves a little bit better and a little bit differently. So now when I have this thing here, I'm in the highlights or notes option. And now I can actually draw my selection that I would like. When I release it, it will be highlighted. And if I long press on it, now I can add a comment, I can edit the selection and I can clean. So if I go into edit, now I can change this to maybe over here. Say OK. It will change it. I can also long press uh there we go so now i long pressed not enough for him to recognize that i was long pressing on the whole thing it recognized that i long pressed on existence so now i have a highlight of this and then i have an added highlight on existence word if you see it's tight it's a bit darker so now i have to press on it press clean and now hopefully i need to wait yes now it selected everything i can add my comment uh, buh, 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 buh. that's my comment and it will function in the same way that we had before so this is a far better option than just pressing and dragging and doing all of those things for me at least personally this works way way better you'll notice that the tab on the top has the scribble option which is just for scribbling and writing stuff um, and we have the eraser. Now when I get into the eraser, I can just simply press 
on this one and it will say this note contains the comment blah, blah, delete the comment sure and then it deletes the comment and the highlighting as well you also have an option let's say if i'm in a highlighting and i select this whole thing and it's like oh no it's a wrong selection then i can just edit go into here confirm then I can get into my scribble and I can now just say like uh, this whatever and once I'm done with that now I can use a screenshot and a screenshot is basically you draw a diagonal and it will automatically give you this kind of uh, rectangle for capturing your screenshot and I, if I select it like this then I can confirm it and I will have a screenshot made from my highlight and the scribbles and everything else that I've made and there's a little bit of icons here always showing up regardless of your formatting so they will go over the text um, if you have a scribble you'll have this icon this is for a snapshot and if I add a comment oh, I'm still in this one and if I add a comment then you will have the icon that indicates that there is a comment on there so the functionalities are there and if you have a lot of patience and a lot of time uh, you can definitely do all of these things and that's that's an okay thing but um, not not ideal and as I said these icons go over the text and I haven't found a way of how to hide them I mean, there, there, it would have been nice to actually have an option to just simply hide this, but there isn't. Now, there's also the option of using the dictionary. Uh, the dictionary is a little bit weird. So, for example, some of the things will work normally, as you would expect. So, for example, the word works, translation works, open, free of access, not shut up, and all that kind of stuff. So, that works. But, for example, if I go into the touch, and I go and select this and it says to compare with of be equal to usually with a negative as he held that for good cheer nothing could touch an open fire oh, just weird um, so yeah the dictionary is there and there is an option of adding and installing your own dictionaries finally we have the option of going into the voice but since it doesn't have speakers I can't really show you but it just works once you plug in a headphone wirelessly or via the USB-C um, port with a 3.5 inch adapter it just works and currently you have only one installed but you can add voices you can install more voice packages and then you have normal uh, volume control speed control and all that sort of stuff and it works fine finally on the bottom you have the progress bar or the scroll progress where you can actually just scroll through it and what i find really nice is that it shows you the um, chapter titles and that's a very nice way of actually knowing where you are in the document what you're looking for etc etc it would have been nice to actually have the uh, beginning of chapter and end of chapter uh, at this one so that you can just navigate to a chapter press the button and then you start reading from the beginning of the chapter but as it is it works I was reading a lot about the Inkpad X while I was researching for this review and one of the questions that I saw and I realized after filming all of the material that I didn't actually cover is what happens with the scribbled notes on the text if you pinch zoom in and zoom out. I've scribbled in what? So now I'm just gonna pinch in so that you can see what happens in real time. There. So it does scale but it takes quite a long time to actually process and do these things. Uh, the thickness, I believe, remains the same. The thickness of the strokes remains the same, yeah. So the thickness of the strokes is relative to the screen, but uh, everything else is actually scaling properly. 
from the apps I'm just gonna cover a couple of them that are important and otherwise you can actually see and some of them are quite self-explanatory such as calculator, chess, Klondike, music player, Sudoku, RSS news etc etc. One thing to note is that the browser is actually a Chrome but it's an older version of Chrome and since you don't have an option of downloading a newer version I think you're just simply stuck with the firmware updates that you will get and more on that later that's a big problem I will explain why if you're interested in uh, the procedure of adding uh, dictionaries please read the user manual there's a clear description there step-by-step -step guide same goes for the voice uh, packs for text-to-speech translations so let's focus on a couple of these that are noteworthy like the scribble so the scribble is literally that you can just paint with your finger and you can choose between um, different types of pens and you can erase like with finger it's a little weird because it feels like finger painting and the drawing is okay and if I had a capacitive stylus I would definitely try it but I don't at the moment so that's a little bit weird of course there's no text recognition at all so no nothing like that you have an option of adding a text box so if I drag in a text box then I can uh, type in my text Ugh. but as you can see the typing experience is consistently painful so I can just type in my text and then I can change the font size, the font uh, type and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can add new pages by pressing on the new page. You can navigate between the pages by pressing the arrows and you can delete the current page that you are at. Um, extremely rudimentary functionality. That's pretty much it. There's, there's nothing more uh, here. So there's no templates, there's no backgrounds, there's nothing. Um, so I think that you would be better off uh, playing with rocks. <laughs> no, sorry. It's just very, very basic. One of the things that's interesting with the apps is the gallery itself. That's actually a useful type of thing. Um, because it supports all of the images, you can browse your internal storage. Now, the internal storage folder structure is expectedly um, not that great so these are your folders and for whatever reason it has like all of the languages in the root itself it doesn't have they're not a they're not uh, native to a single folder that would contain them so that just inherently creates a huge mess so let's say I choose this photo and it doesn't fit right so I can now uh, oh no sorry um, so now I can long press to enter the edit uh, mode. This is the edit mode. Now I can zoom in and let's say I reposition the photo. Oh, this is really... So let's say I just reposition it this way. And, and as soon as I release, it just does these weird things. See what it does? It just... So I'm literally just lifting my finger and it's... Okay, let's wait, lift, and it moves. Um, but that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is now you go to the menu and you have the option of assigning the picture that you have here as either the boot logo or the power off logo. So let's say that I go to power off logo. Look what it did. It just completely goes bananas. And actually this is what I'm gonna get. So if I go back to home now, and I press this to actually get there. Well, yeah, that, that clearly didn't work at all. So this is my power off screen right now. That's, that's just broken. That just doesn't work. I really recommend you not to try and use the edit mode. Instead, prepare your own images with a native um, uh, format so that they can actually fit without the need to edit anything because this clearly is not capable of doing that um, so let's see here what what's going on now why why is everything different why all right um, so let's find my folder my pictures stop 
and this is the image that I prepared which is in the native format now I can long press and if I don't have to use the scaling and all that kind of stuff and pi press as a power off logo now it will actually work because now when I power off it will be able to actually use the image that I've assigned as the power off logo so that works but only if you prepare it properly. Um, next one that's interesting to mention is the notes and that's basically a summary of all of your annotations that you have in any of the documents and then you can just simply enter the documents and it will display all the notes that you have and then you can expand and see all of the things including the screenshots, uh, comments, and scribbles themselves so let's say yeah there's a pencil drawing and then that that works so it's um, it's a really good way of uh, checking things out and navigating of course it takes a little bit more time uh, more more scribbles and notes and everything else you have There are several ways of getting content onto the Inkpad X and off it. Uh, the first one and most obvious one is to simply plug in the USB-C and it will ask you do you want to connect and transfer files and say yes and then you simply transfer files and it will appear as a USB device on your computer. So that's fine. But the really cool one is that you have actually the Dropbox Pocketbook option and once you actually sync it with the Dropbox you log in just once and what it does, it creates a dedicated Dropbox pocketbook folder on your Dropbox as well. And that's the only folder that's being synced. So whatever you drop there, it will appear here once it actually syncs. And if it's not synced, then you can always go into the notifications area, sync, and that will work. Additionally, and it works in a similar way, but quite original, is the send to pocketbook functionality. What the send to pocketbook does is it basically, you register for the service, and you register an email that you would like to use. So uh, once you do register, let's say your normal email that you want to send content from, you will get a dedicated email address, for example, username at uh, pb for pocketbook, pbsync.com. So then you can use my username at pbsync.com and you can send an email with attachments to that email. And after a certain period of time, the uh, when the device is online and with Wi-Fi, it will check and it will sync and it will download those things and the files that you sent to that email address, you will never receive an email, but the files themselves will appear in send to pocketbook for example these are the files that i sent to it and they will be automatically stored internally on send to pb folder so this is something that definitely is useful and for me i think it's quite a nice thing to actually sim be able to simply email documents to your device directly so that works nice And finally, we have the settings option, which is where you will be able to configure and check your Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, accounts and synchronization. This is where you set up your Dropbox, uh, send to Pocketbook account, Adobe DRM if you need to, and all sorts of goodies. Um, then we also have personalizing. And in personalizing, there's a couple things. You can auto turn the G sensor on. You can customize your front light. You can customize boot and power off logo as well uh, you can adjust how the device will behave when for refreshing uh, what to do on open up and uh, other kinds of things one of the ones that's actually quite a useful is the key mapping and then you can change how these hardware keys the buttons themselves will behave in different uh, global mode epub fb2 and others or pdf and djvu formats so for example if i wanted to i could um, yeah change that holding this one will be one of these things so customizability is actually quite nice and that's something that I like. I really do like the option of being able to make your device work for you properly the way you want it to. Then you have the languages option, which is where you set up your keyboard layouts, available dictionaries and text to speech packages. We have power management, we have date and time. And incidentally, if you go into the notifications and you tap on the date, you will have a full screen calendar. 
and you have a shortcut to date and time settings. However, you can flip between months, uh, you can return to current date, but there is absolutely nothing you can do with any of the dates. So you can't use this as your uh, scheduler or anything like that. It's simply like a calendar that's showing there. Then we have a very important category called maintenance and uh, this is where you can set up how the USB mode will be by default. Is it going to ask or go to PC link? But this one's important, the privacy. By default this is turned on and it will turn and it will send diagnostic and usage of your device to someone. Uh, but I turned that off because I don't like that. Um, then you also have the pin code for your overall device. There's no uh, encryption options at all. You can format internal memory, you can factory reset, demo mode, which uh, I don't know why. And you can calibrate the screen with the touches like the first time you start it up. Finally, we have the software option, which is where you will be able to check out which software version you have and uh, software updating uh, things. Now, here I have to mention another very big red flag. Latest software release that I have is dated October 11th, 2019. Date of recording this is May 6th, I believe. So we're talking about eight months without a single update. And if I search for updates, I don't get them. So it's telling me that I have the latest update uh, and the latest update seems to be um, from October of 2019. And that's, that's extremely worrying because that seems like an abandoned product. In the user manual, it also says that you're able to manually download the firmware and install it and it guides you to the uh, website and then you just type in and select the device. But when, when I go into the, um, their website, this device is not listed in the list of current devices. So I am unable to get an automatic update and I'm unable to get a manual update either. And that's combined with the store, the, the crickets in the store, Honestly, that's not the type of experience that I'm looking for and that's not the type of experience that I would expect for the high price range of the device and especially for a device that's been marketed as the uh, premium high-end model, the flagship model of the pocketbook offering. There's clearly something going wrong with the whole thing and it shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't be that your flagship model has been abandoned for eight months and it shouldn't be that you cannot find the flagship model on their website. So I honestly don't know what's going on. Now why are the updates important? Well first of all they would improve the functionality and there's plenty to improve on the Inkpad X. But most importantly, for example, the Chrome, the browser Chrome that's in uh, that's actually implemented here is of an outdated version that has security issues. Now the browser function is really, really slow. Um, it's so slow that half the time I don't know if it's doing anything or not. So right now I've typed in Inkpad X and I pressed enter and now it's finally getting somewhere. So I am able to actually scroll and go through this. And if I go to the pocketbookinternational.com, um, the device is listed as their premium flagship e-reader, right? Well, let's wait for it to actually load. If I am adventurous enough and I navigate to the uh, support section and then wait. And I try to choose a product. You will see, hopefully you will be able to see that there is no Inkpad X. I don't have it. And I try different regions and I couldn't find Inkpad X listed anywhere. 
and I, I don't I don't get it I really don't get it and that's a big problem for me All right, so let's wrap up the story around the Inkpad X and let's start with the pros. This is a very light and stylish 10.3 inch e-reader and as such it's a pleasant thing to handle. The large screen is extremely good for reading and it provides for a really really pleasant experience for reading books and documents and all of these kind of things. But I found it most pleasant for EPUBs for example because of the formatting and the everything else it really felt like reading a book. The front light that the Inkpad X sports is one of the best ones that I've seen on the device so far. It's soft and uniform but it lights up everything nicely so you definitely do not have the glare effect at all and there's no spilling of the light or anything like that so I think that they've achieved something really really special here and I don't know of another device that's so uniform and so pretty on such a large screen so that's definitely a big plus. It is possible to use Adobe Digital Editions as a sideload or other documents from libraries because the Inkpad X supports the DRM, PDFs and EPUBs. It also supports a little bit more exotic formats such as CBR and CBZ uh, and no cheat music and combined with the large display and uh, front light I think it's something that's actually usable. Now for the cons of the device, and unfortunately there are many. First of all, design-wise, while the weight and the size is actually really pleasant to use, I do have a continuous problem with these edges here. They're simply too sharp, and that's meant to be a holding area, I guess. But the end result is that these edges keep digging into your palms, and on a prolonged reading session, you resort to holding the device on the sides. And I just don't see a reason why that was done that way. The device doesn't have speakers. It has full audio support but no speakers and I think that's a missed opportunity because it would have elevated the usability device and comfort of use a little bit further. As you've seen in the store there's not much content. So basically you have to sideload everything and that's a bit of a problem because you're limited to DRM protected files or Adobe Digital Editions or some libraries. There's no Kindle support or anything like that so it's a little bit limiting. The biggest problem of all, however, by far, is the overall performance. Um, to call the device sluggish is to be extremely flattering. Uh, every single thing that you do, you have to wait and wait and wait and wait. The only operation that doesn't take time is to flip a page and only when using these buttons down below. That's the only time when the device feels responsive and normal. Everything else is simply too slow to be justified. Another surprising con is actually the battery life. I've been using the device for actively for about three days and the battery is down from 100% to 61%. They claim battery life of maybe up to a month depending on your connectivity. I keep my Wi-Fi off. I didn't browse much or anything, I was just reading stuff, annotating and testing the device like a normal reader. And the battery just keeps falling, 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 falling and I followed the initial instruction of keeping it plugged in for a really long time for the first charge. So I really don't know if the device is able to actually hold the charge for normal use, even two weeks. User experience overall is quite clumsy and it feels dated. There's really no excuse to force the user to uh, touch and go through so many menus and submenus and always go back to a home menu and then tap a gazillion times to just go back to where you were and some of the things don't really work properly etc etc so overall the user experience and the user interface looks pretty but the usage of it is really not good and it's something that should definitely be improved on all over the place. One of the hardware problems that I have is that there's no contrast control for the display whatsoever let alone separate image control and text control like you have on Note 2 or Nova 2. Um, this one has no contrast control at all. Another big problem for me personally is that the last firmware update that I can find for this device uh, is dated October 2019. And that's like a big giant red flag for me because this is a flagship device and when combined with the fact that you can't find a newer firmware update than one from 8 months ago, um, and that when you try to actually search for the product on their website, you can't find it in the list of products. That's a bit of a problem. 
and it's certainly not the case that the user experience in OS are in such a state that it's like, job done, there's like no need for any improvements for 8 months. Certainly there are products like that, but this, this is not one of them. And then you couple all of that with the price, which is 450 US dollars. 450 dollars for this. Oh, wow. So how to summarize the Inkpad X? I think that the Inkpad X provides for a very pleasant reading experience because of the very large screen, good formatting options and one of the best front lights I've seen on any device so far. However, the constant performance lagging in literally any operation that you do, it will unfortunately leave you with plenty of time to ponder whether the development team and the device should have delivered more for the price that you paid for it. I believe that they should have, and I know that there's plenty of other devices out there in a similar price range um, that will deliver you a far better overall experience and way, way better value for your money. If you like the video, please like and subscribe and tick off the Instagram, Twitter, Facebook thingy so that we can grow the My Deep Guide environment into something really special. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for the support. Stay healthy and stay safe and see you in the next video. Bye.